All right, so um, last week we started uh, part two, where we're talking about multiple servers, multiple systems interacting. And so we talked about replication, and that's where we're taking uh, the same data and having multiple copies of it. So the challenge there is, is rights. So this week we're talking about partitioning, which is within each data set, each database, just splitting it up across multiple boxes, um, you know, primarily uh, for scalability reasons, right? Um, and partitioning does not have nearly, oops, too much, sorry, hold on. Um, nearly the complexity that replication does because with replication, you have multiple copies of the same thing. So when you have a write, you have to figure out how to get the write eventually to every copy. Partitioning, the whole idea is that um, you're splitting it up. And so each write amongst multiple partitions still only needs to go to one partition. Okay. Um, and so what we'll see is that the problems are just much, much smaller here in partitioning. Now, as a note, partitioning is often used in conjunction with replication. And so all the issues of replication still apply to the replication portion of things. But the addition of partitioning, thankfully, isn't introducing a lot of new problems on top of the problems that you had with just the replication. So that's what that's what this week's chapter is about. Um, so there's a couple main topics in the chapter. The first one is how do you decide how you're going to split things up? Okay, um, <clears throat> and there's a couple main ways. So the first thing you could do is if you're looking things up by a key. Um, and this could be documents, could be whatever, but just thinking of it, it uh, abstractly as just key value. Um, you split up the key into ranges. Um, and if you have continuous ranges, then the nice thing is if you did want to do some type of range query, if you wanted to know, you know, people's last names between whatever, you know, Smith and, and Thomas, you know, um, then they're all kind of there, you know, on the same partition. Right. Um, but the challenge with this is that uh, it's hard to know a priori how to evenly split the keys amongst a different number of, of partitions. So you can do manual, you can do automatic on the boundaries. Um, uh, but it does have the benefit that in addition to having continuous ranges on the same uh, partition, not only that, but within the partition, the technology you use, you can actually store the data in sorted order. Um, so, so conceptually, uh, there's some benefits and you can do things that we talk about later on in terms of rebalancing and splitting to try and like balance the workload. However, what this doesn't really fix is the problem that you can very easily have hotspots. And so I think the example they gave in the book is, if you have something like sensor data and it's and you partition things by time, by date, by time, well then all the activity is gonna be on the most recent partition. You know, so you could you could wind up with this thing where, you know, no matter what you do, the most current day is getting all the writes and it's getting 80% of the reads. And so that that just won't work for that type of a use case. Um so then the other alternative you can do is you can hash the keys and there's various hashing algorithms. And so the idea is that um, effectively as close as possible, uh, the hash function is, is gonna create uh, a uniform distribution of hash values. And so then, then you know that, um, okay, it's gonna be pretty much fairly split across the different partitions. Um, so the downside of that is that now, if you're trying to do a range query, it you know, the hash function is basically going to just scatter. Um, so if you do, you know, last names between Smith and Thomas, then then basically they're going to get scattered everyone. So the load will be even, but now they're just all over the place. And I thought this was kind of an interesting thing, where uh, the author talked about in Cassandra, you have uh, compound keys, and so if the I forget the example. Um, they gave um, in the book, but it's sort of like if you uh, if you hash the sensor ID, but the second key 
is is uh, uh, date time, then essentially um, yes, the sensors will be evenly split across all the partitions. But within a given part, a given sensor ID, you can have all the data sorted by date and time. And so then it's very easy to do a range query within a given sensor. And if you want X many sensors, then then most likely those X many sensors are all going to be spread out amongst the different partitions. All right, so that's that's sort of the opening in terms of of partitioning. So the main the first question is just how do you split things up between partitions? So um, any comments or questions? I forgot to ask at the beginning just if there were particular uh, questions or topics people wanted to hit today. So I'll just pause here. All right. Well, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, I'll just keep moving on. So, um, as I said, the nice thing about um, hashing is that it will it will tend to create a uniform distribution, but that's still no guarantee that you won't have hotspots. So, you know, imagine if you're Twitter or something like that. You know, you can evenly spread all of the accounts across multiple partitions. But if you have certain users who just have millions and millions of followers, um, and then if there's some event, so if that if that celebrity has a concert or a, or or they're in the news for something good because they're getting married or something bad because the police, you know, then you could just have this burst of activity all associated with this one user, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, that's still going to create very um, imbalanced workload across your partitions. So um, generally speaking, none of the commercial products at the, at the time of the writing of this book have any type of automated solution for this. And then there's some things you can do. You can try and like augment the key with some sort of random value and then that will spread things out. So then your celebrities can have basically have sub keys that are spread across the different partitions. Um, but this is like not something you would want to apply universally to every user. So it's still kind of this awkward thing where you would have to sort of manually decide who are your special case high volume users that you want to that you want to treat this this extra way. All right, so that's that's how you deal with your primary key and how you do partitioning. So then the next thing is secondary keys. So this is different from the compound keys. So if you're saying, okay, um, I have a database of cars and uh, if someone wants to buy a used car, you know, I have whatever, let's say uh, make as, you know, my primary key, but let's say somebody wants to do a search by color. Well, how are we going to handle that? So you can have another index for color and there's, you know, two common ways uh, that, that you're going to store this secondary index if you at all even allow it. I thought about doing a little lookup just to see uh, today if there are any of the big companies that I, I didn't get around to, I'm sorry, but just to see um, if there are, are the key value stores that today still don't even support secondary indexes. Um, it's not, it's a non-trivial thing to support it. Uh, it's just fundamentally that, that no SQL key value paradigm doesn't really line up with secondary indexes. So of the two ways to do it, one way is you have this local index, right? Um, and so the idea is that uh, on each partition, you keep track of, in this case, I said like color of the cars, you keep track of color of all of the data that's on your partition. And all the other partitions have to keep track themselves as well. And so you're going to have red cars, black cars, white cars, and every other partition is gonna have red cars, black cars white cars. So if somebody wants to do a query and they say, I want red cars, then basically they're going to have to go to every partition and say, tell me about your red cars. And then get back data results from all of them and then merge those results together. So that's what they call scatter gather. Um, so if that's the case, then why would you, you know, want to do this if it sort of creates that extra, it's, it's a lot of traffic. It's also just like like conceptual, you know, work that needs to be done to do the scatter gather. Well, the reason is because writes are very simple. So if you insert a new car, then even if you had 10 secondary indexes based on 
whatever, you know, color, type of engine, this, that, 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 that. All those secondary indexes are local to your partition. No biggie. So that's why, um, that's why this local index um, architecture um, kind of makes sense. So the other thing you could do is instead of doing that, you could just say, no, 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 no. we're not going to spread out the index um, all over the place. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have a global index. We're just going to have one index for color. Um, the thing that I thought was kind of interesting about this at first, I was like, oh, but after thinking about it a little bit, I realized that this global index is actually still spread out across all the different partitions. Um, if you didn't do that, you'd have hotspots. Um, but the idea is that for a particular key or a particular range, so if you say red cars, then red is probably located only on one partition. So as long as you're accessing the secondary index that way. And so um, um, if you had a secondary index that was date, I guess there's a possibility if you wanted a date range, you said last week, that maybe, you know, part of last week is on one partition, the, the second half of it, of that range, it lives on another partition. So maybe you end up hitting two partitions, but at least most likely you're hitting, you know, one, maybe two, but not all the partitions, not like scattered together. Um, so um, the cool thing about doing reads with, with this global type of secondary index is again, that you're only hitting one or two uh, partitions. The downside for this, however, is writes. So imagine a scenario where you do an insert of a new car in this database and you actually did have a dozen different secondary indexes. Well, just randomly speaking, those secondary indexes are gonna be on different partitions. And so just to insert one row, you wind up then having to push all this stuff out um, to all these other um, partitions to say, hey, update your secondary index, insert this new value for this car that's red, insert this new value for this car that's this type of engine. And in particular, um, the danger with this is that you can really slow down the response time to the user if you require all of these secondary indexes to be updated synchronously before you return success to the user. So there's the note for this reason, this is why you usually do asynchronous uh, behind the scenes updates. And that's all well and good for normal operations, but then it does create a bunch of failure modes that if something fails between the time when the initial row was inserted and when all the secondary indexes are updated, then what do you do? So that can be a bit of a challenge. All right. So let me just pause here. So that's that's the main content about how do we create partitions? How do we store them? How do we store information on them? Um, the next topics are gonna be about uh, how do you keep things balanced? So any comments or questions? All right. All right, um, what okay. happens if, sorry, what happens if hotspots are not in the same place? If they wander around, I mean, at, at first one piece of information is hotspot, and in a few days it is another. Basically, what the author said is that if you have a hotspot like Twitter, you have some really popular person, then at the application level, you kind of need to special case this that that there is no generic database solution to solve for. Mm -hmm. That's okay. all I got. I have a quick question. So about the last item, uh, mm -hmm. about right to the global second uh, index. Mm -hmm. So you said rights are more complex because other positions may need to be updated for each. So for example, we are uh, inserting a new item. Let's take the car as example. We are inserting a new car into the database. In this case, uh, say it's a red colored car. So we need to uh, go to the color secondary index. And then it will be only involved one partition. We assume like all the red color. 
that secondary index is in one partition. So we just go ahead to go to that partition and update it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So imagine that your primary key is on, on make, okay? And so you say, okay, it's I'm inserting a row for a Toyota. And so that's on, let's say you have, let's say you have whatever, nine partitions. And so Toyota is on partition eight. So then I have, if I have a lot, if I have a dozen secondary indexes, so then I'm gonna insert a row into the red index because it's a red Toyota. Well, if I'm lucky, red might happen to be on partition eight, but maybe it's on partition seven. Okay. And then I have a secondary index on the type of engine. So this car has a V6. Well, maybe that's on partition. So, so, so the, the engine type index is, is spread out across all nine partitions. But the key V6, maybe that's on, on, on partition four, right? And then if I really have a dozen secondary indexes, I don't even know what a dozen features for cars are, but like the style of car, how big it is, whatever, I don't know. Um, for each of these dozen indexes, whatever your particular value is, I'm an SUV, uh, I have, you know, four wheel drive, I, have X many cup holders, you know, whatever those indexes are, uh, you're going to have a particular value. And so you're going to have to insert into the place where it's storing, you know, um, that thing. And so just statistically, you know, randomly, if you, if you have a bunch of these odds are that they're just going to wind up on a bunch of different servers. So can I consider the main differences, like say we have a global secondary index, like we have three secondary index. And then I want instead of one item, I need to, seems like there are four rights there, at least like one right is to go yes. insert item for the primary key case. And then we need three other rights for updating the other three secondary index in terms of, and then compares with the first, uh, compared with the key range partitioning, um, all those things we can just finish in one partition, like we insert that to that partition and then in the same partition, we will update all the secondary index, which is the local secondary index. That's right. You're okay. always doing four writes. So if you insert a row, you always have to insert into the primary key and you have to insert separately into each secondary index. Um, with local indexes, you guarantee that all four of those inserts are happening on the same server. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But but reads get complicated. But but um, when you do this global index, then you incur this this potential. Not even potential, but like the likely scenario is that your secondary index writes are going to be on other partitions, and the whole point of this architecture, right, is is to scale this, and so you cannot guarantee fast response as soon as you're trying to do a write to another server. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, do anyone know like how Spark data is partitioned by default? Because most of the time I just partition by the column I specify, but then I'm just curious if they're run, like what is under the hood if I don't specify a partition. So Spark um, initially was created with Hadoop. Um, right. Now it supports lots and lots of different uh, data stores behind the scenes. Um, but when you talk about partitioning in Spark, generally speaking, like, um, you know, Spark is going to, uh, let's see here. So, so map reduce, this is actually stuff that's covered, like, I think in like chapter. 12 on batch processing or something like that. But um, so MapReduce, the idea is you ship the computation to where the data is, okay? So you, so you spread out the data on a Hadoop cluster. Um, and if you say all my, all my um, cars are, are, are split out by, let's just sim for simplicity by make, then you simply say, if I need to count the number of cars, then I tell the node that has the Toyotas, count how many Toyotas. And I tell the node that has the Ford, count how many Fords. And then I can just take all those sums. And if I, I know mathematically, if I add those together, then I'll get the grand total sum, right? So that's the map reduced paradigm. 
So, so Spark isn't about pushing the computation to where the data is. Uh, Spark is more about, I have an optimizer, I know where the data is, I'm going to do various calculations, and when necessary, I will actually move data from one node to another node to do a different kind of computation. Um, so, so the partitioning is really there about being very aware of physically where the data is. In this case, we're not worried about sort of a transactional database. You know what I mean? So this isn't like, in, you gen, generally not, the use case for Spark isn't that I have this database of used cars and now somebody added a new used car and so I'm gonna do an insert into this data. So generally speaking, your, 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 your Spark data is going to be sort of like a, this is not, 100% accurate, but it's it's you know it's going to be sort of a uh, an offline data warehouse re you know replica of your of your live transactional data. So it's already based on like the like how your data is stored, and then just take that as partition. Yeah, and depending on the nature of your calculation, you can choose. You can say my online transactional database might store things this particular way but I'm gonna incur the cost to re-spread it out and partition it this other way, right? So, um, so my live database may be partitioned by make, but I'm gonna actually store the data in my Spark cluster by date because I know the types of calculations I'm doing, it is much more efficient to keep all the cars by date together. Um, and, and that's my very minimal, I don't, I don't do a lot of Spark stuff, but that's my very minimal understanding of how people manually tune and optimize their Spark calculations is that they, um, Spark itself has an optimizer, but it, it won't, for the most part, it won't do super aggressive data moves. It'll shuffle data around as it needs for the computations. But you can say, before I even start the computation, move everything around so it's sorted by date. Do this whole series of steps. And now I'm going to do some other calculations. So reshuffle all this data and now sort it by, you know, by engine size. And, and, and I know that that will, in the end, cause the rest of these computations to be more efficient. So that's where people are hand tuning there their um, data flows by sort of manually inserting these massive expensive data moves, but just because they know that that's gonna reduce the moves that Spark has to do later on. Does that make sense? Yeah, because I, I asked this question because um, like oh, I, on my job, I have to like, help refining the Spark data pipeline. So like, understanding how partition works so how to make the query more efficient really really helps like sometimes you over, like create too, way too many partitions and like the storage becomes very inefficient or the calculation becomes very inefficient and then it breaks down so um, that's why um like like what you said like the manual yeah. repartitioning prior to a certain calculation really makes a difference yeah, yeah. If you if you if you if your order data is sorted by date, and you're going to do a bazillion calculations per customer, you probably end up winning in the long run by doing this super expensive repartitioning by customer at the beginning, right? That's that's very costly. Yeah. But yeah. then all these other calculations run much 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 faster because you know it's able to keep the data very local for for the rest of the computations. Yeah, um, sometimes like if you have uneven partitions and then um, the date, like the calculation only happens in certain partition, but the other ones are not used, then um, no. your 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 job might break too. So there are many yeah. ways that you can break. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I forget what that's called, but where you have like the one slowest node and everybody's waiting for it, right? So, <laughs> exactly. so if all your calculations happening on two nodes, even though you have a sixty-four node cluster, sixty-two of them are just sitting there, like, huh? I don't have data for, for what you care about. It's all over there. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing that the Spark optimizer doesn't really know how to solve for the most part, right? You're more manually 
detecting these bottlenecks and saying, oh, if I actually spread that data out over all 60 nodes, then, then I could get them. Obviously, there's a one-time cost you pay, but if, if it helps enough, then you get bang for your buck. So I haven't read ahead <laughs> far enough, but I do know that the, the batch processing chapter, like half of it's on MapReduce and that it does talk about Spark a little bit. Awesome. Sounds great. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for asking questions. I, I feel much better when it's more of a conversation. Otherwise, I don't know if I'm just boring you guys or, or whatever. Um, okay, so we talked about how we, how we locate the data and how we locate secondary indexes if they're supported. So the next thing is, as, as much as you do this, ultimately you're gonna have to do rebalancing. Um, so you can do rebalancing for two reasons. Um, uh, you can do long-term rebalancing for two reasons. Uh, one is because you discover that the data is, is skewed. You know, you divide it up a certain way, um, but ultimately, you know, even though like you looked at the dictionary and you decided to split the alphabet by whatever, for some reason, everybody with the letter A is signing up for your service and nobody with the letter T is signing up for your service. And so the A partition is just overloaded. So now you got to split it up. The other way in which it'll happen is good news, your company's taking off and um, you just have more and more customers. So even though your partitions are perfectly uniformly spread, we're gonna go from five partitions to nine partitions because the company's growing. So we just need to be able to take it and spread it over more nodes. So those are like the long-term reasons why you do it. Short-term also, you just have a node failure and other ones are picking up um, the workload, that sort of a thing. Um, so, so, so it mentions, so um, typically the way rebalancing is thought about, while the rebalancing is happening, you're still supporting activity. So it's not like you shut the whole system down and rebalance. So you have to consider that. Um, you ideally, again, want to spread everything evenly. Um, and then of course, the goal is to minimize the amount of data that you're moving. So um, they give an example of if you hash things and you just take this resulting number and you do you know, modulo the number of nodes you have. Rebalancing for this would be really terrible because if you do some number, you know, modulo five, and then you change it to uh, seven nodes and you do um, these hash numbers modulo seven, then basically huge amounts of your data are gonna have to move from one partition to the new partition where, there's, where they're supposed to be. So, so you're not gonna handle it something like that, even though mathematically that's very simple, uh, that's gonna result in lots of movement. So they come up with other schemes for how to do it. Um, so one thing, if you think about it, that, that's relatively easy is if you have seven nodes, you don't have to have seven partitions. You could have a thousand partitions and put roughly 140 of them on each of, of the uh, servers. And so then, if you want to go to um, nine partitions, then basically like each one can like give up 30 partitions. So then they're down to 110 on each server. And then the new servers, you know, they pick up partitions from all the other guys. And then they also have about 110. So that's a pretty, you know, straightforward way of doing things. And unless your company just grows like crazy, um, you know, if you start with a thousand partitions, then uh, sorry, a thousand, yeah, a thousand of these little mini partitions, then no matter how many actual servers you have, if you have three, five, nine, 11, you know, it'll, you'll be able to distribute them fairly evenly across the different servers. Um, and then they, they talk about this clever thing that you can do is that um, at, in reality, as you're, as you add servers to uh, uh, your system, maybe the new servers are faster than your old servers. So maybe you actually want to purposefully give them an uneven number to say, oh, the new servers, they can handle 20% more, you know, than the old ones or something like that. So that's kind of a, a, a clever thing you can do. Um, so fixed partitions works well for most use cases, uh, but if you really are unsure, another thing you can do is you can do dynamic partitioning where basically, um, Partitions can either be split or merged. Excuse me one sec. 
<laughs> I had a sneeze there, but it didn't come out. Um, so if you if you merge and split partitions, if you support both those functions, then the database can grow or shrink infinitely, and basically your your, your bases are covered. Um, so uh, um, so basically, the the typical way this is implemented, you you have a size range, and so basically, let's say your size range is ten to twenty gigabytes. Okay, um, when it exceeds twenty gigabytes. You split it into two chunks that are about 10 each. And um, as you keep doing this, if there are more partitions, eventually you can say, OK, I split into two. I'm going to keep one. And somebody else who has a lighter load is going to take the other one. So that's a good way where over time, the partitions will spread around and, um, and you'll be able to balance your load, but with fairly minimal data movement. Um, let's see here. Uh, what else is in the notes here? Um, I don't know if all these databases support merging. I mean, usually you worry about databases growing. You don't really worry about databases sh shrinking. It was mentioned, but not, not really in much detail. Um, and then and this other Cassandra use case I thought was, was kind of interesting. Um, so they do partitioning proportional to the number of nodes. So instead of having these hard coded sizes, like between, you know, at 20 gigabytes, we split it into two. Um, they just simply say, we're gonna have, you know, five partitions per server. Um, and so then these partitions will over time keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but the kind of cool thing is that real world companies, as they grow, what they will tend to do is increase the number of servers. And so because of that, then if your size doubles, but you go from three to five partitions, then effectively you've kind of um, doubled the number of servers approximately. And so then now your, your partition size comes back down to sort of the original size again. Um, so uh, it's a little bit different algorithm with the, I think the intent being still that you're going to have a relatively stable partition size. So those are three different approaches, just sort of having a fixed hard coded number of partitions, expecting that you have enough that you can just spread them out evenly amongst your different servers. Um, you can split them or you can use this thing of this clever thing of a fixed number per the number of servers you have. All right, and then um, the last thing on rebalancing I thought was kind of interesting is you could do it in a fully automated way where the system just says, whoa, look, this partition is really big. It's 22 gig. We said 20 was a limit. I'm going to split it. I'm going to move half of it onto this other server that has lighter load. But if, say, you know, your Twitter, Facebook, something, and let's say 8 p.m. is the busiest time of the day when there's the most activity, if your system automatically detects that at 8 p.m., it's going to suddenly be doing this split and it's going to be trying to copy this data from one partition to another right in the middle of your peak time. So maybe what you want is a system that's semi-automated where it detects the problem, it alerts the operator and says, hey, this, this partition is getting really big. Maybe we want to split it to try and balance the workload. And then the operator can decide, it's 8 p.m. I'm not going to press go. I'm actually going to wait a few hours. Then when it's not on our peak busy time, then I'm going to say, OK, go ahead and do it now. Um, and then I thought there's an interesting race case here that they mention where um, if, you, if you have a node that's slow and your system detects a failure, then what it needs to do is it needs to uh, start you know, offloading data onto the other nodes. And if if that causes, uh, if you have rebalancing that then kicks off on top of that, you can kind of get into this race condition where it's just piling on more and more load for these background processes that has absolutely nothing to do with your users. And so again, you may want to insert a human into the middle to sort of say, does this make sense? You know, should I say, yes, go ahead and rebalance? Um, if you have a 24 hour operations, like, you know, a big company like Twitter, 
then it, it seems pretty reasonable that you would insert that. If you're a small company, you know, maybe you don't have that kind of resources. Uh, but if you're a small company and it's eight hours before the operator shows up to say, oh, look, there's a warning message saying the partitions want to be rebalanced. Is that, is, I mean, can you tolerate, you know, eight hours, maybe. So, so anyway, so that's, that's the last thing on rebalancing. All right, so then the last topic has to do with request routing and, um, and this is a, uh, a, a partial discussion. So, uh, so some of this stuff, I think we're gonna see, we're gonna revisit some of these concepts in, in later chapters. Um, but the main thing is that since we're saying that nodes can be moved around, uh, rebalance, split, then you have this service discovery problem somebody needs to keep track of some somehow people need to know if i'm looking for toyotas where do i send my request what ip address do i send my request for toyotas so you can say that um the clients are going to send a request to a node and if it's the wrong node that node will forward it on or you can say i'm going to add a new layer i'm going to have an intermediate tier that's just the request processing tier and so the request is oh you want to query for Toyotas? I'll send that to node four. Um, or somehow you can say that in my application, it's a, it's a custom application. Um, I can keep track of things there and I'll just tell the clients. It doesn't matter in any one of these three scenarios, still there is a particular computer, whether it's the individual nodes, whether it's this new routing tier or whether it's the clients, somebody has to actually keep track of this list. So it doesn't matter which of those you use, you still have to have some way of saying, I'm gonna update that list that says, Toyota's on node four. Oh wait, now Toyota got moved to node five. And so um, there's consensus is one of the general algorithms you can use. So that's tricky. That's gonna be talked about in chapter nine. Last week we mentioned a little bit. So a lot of people use Zookeeper. Um, so Zookeeper came up last week. Um, and then another way that you can do it is, is using um, what they call a, a gossip protocol. And I'm not quite sure. I, I, I read a little bit about gossip protocols. I'm not really quite sure. Um, so, so, I mean, gossip protocols, basically it's like the, the, the nodes just sort of talk to each other and they say, hey, by the way, I moved Toyotas from node four to node five. Um, but I, what I don't know, and I don't know if anybody here knows, what do you do in the case where somebody requests Toyota before the notification actually went out? You know, in that small window of time before the, before the gossip message went out. And, and my guess is that it's, it may be just application specific, but you know, it could either be the case that when you do that, you just, um, uh, you, you, you fail the, the, the read request, you know, um, it could be that that forces at that point you to send some some gossip messages. Oh, you're not quite up to date. Toyota got moved over to Node Five. I'm not quite sure how it works, but basically the idea is that Zookeeper is the idea of a central authority, and the gossip protocol is the idea of just distributed. You're sending out information. You're sending out updates. Much like last week, uh, somebody was talking about the the gateway updates. So there's no way you can have central updates for the internet. And so you have to have something that's more like gossip protocol where basically you have these, um, um, these gateway update protocols where they're just sort of sending out messages and you know that there's gonna be a latency uh, before these messages sort of percolate their way you know, all the way around. All right, any questions about request routing? I know there's, there's still, to me, this was sort of like introducing the question, but not really answering it completely in the book. Uh, I have a quick question. So I know one concern. I have heard of one consensus, consensus a protocol called Paxos, I think. Uh, can, is that one kind of gossip protocol? Uh, I think consensus, I'm not familiar with it. I don't know a lot about consensus. 
uh, I'll learn more when we read chapter nine, but I'm pretty sure that consensus is different than gossip protocol. So consensus means right now, let's all this, all of the um, nodes talk to each other and agree on some answer to some question. Okay, so there's different questions you can a you, you answer. You can answer, you know, um, who's the leader right now? You know, is this node down? Where are Toyotas currently stored? Okay, um, gossip protocol is not a synchronous, we're going to decide this now. It's just sort of like, um, hey, by the way, node two, I moved um, Toyotas from node four to five. Hey, by the way, node one, I moved Toyotas from node four to node five. And depending on the protocol, it can either be kind of a star scheme where, where you tell everybody, or it can be one where it's like, I tell node two, and then node two tells node one, and it just sort of spreads. So I think generally gossip protocol is more of the, the latter. Instead of you telling everyone, it's you tell a certain number of people and then, and then they tell a certain number of people and it just sort of spreads. So the way I think of it is that you wouldn't pass every update independently. You're sort of collecting a bunch of updates. And so when node two tells no one, he's like, no two's gonna say, oh, I heard this from node four, Toyota moved over here. And I also heard this thing from node three that Ford's moved over there. And then there was this other thing that I heard um, that you know Ferraris, they also got moved from, from node three to node five. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, there was a, a final little section about parallel execution. Um, and so sort of talking about the difference between, we talked about ranges a little bit, mostly, you know, we think of this as like um, pulling a single key. But so if you have an analytic use case, so this would be like typically, you know, Spark runs, things like that. Then you're gonna wanna pull um, things from multiple nodes in parallel. And so this is where Spark, for example, has an optimizer that coordinates this. Um, and so I guess chapter 10 is the batch processing chapter. So they're gonna talk about, about that. So even though we have these partitions, we have things spread out, we don't necessarily have the technology to really take advantage of them very well. We're just trying to, what this chapter mostly has just covered is the scalability stuff. So if you have Facebook users and they're just looking for their news feed, you've now successfully spread out that workload over multiple servers so that the server just doesn't get overloaded and crash. All right, any other um, comments, questions? I have a I have a sort of hypothetical scenario. So uh, imagine a scenario that you have a hundred servers potentially, and you have not that much data. I would assume splitting things into a bunch of partitions and throwing it across many different servers is probably going to just add extra overhead you don't need. Do you think there's any way for it to automatically detect that and kind of say, okay, we have a hundred servers available, but let's only put partitions on five of them because that's all we need at this point. I don't know these uh, product, this product space really well, but I think that if you used um, um, dynamic partitioning, okay, where you say, uh, 20 gigabytes, I'm going to split it into two 10 gig halves and below 10 or maybe below five gigabytes, I'm going to merge uh, two subsets. Then um, maybe some constraints because you don't necessarily want it to merge everything down to one mm -hmm. partition, but there may be some sort of minimum number. So if you, if your product supports merging and you're worried about this use case, I think what you could do is you turn on merging. And then I don't think the system will 
shut down your nodes. But if you look and you see that merging has happened and I'm actually only using seven of my hundred nodes, then you could, as, as an administrator, you could say, I'm gonna change a parameter, max nodes is now 20, and then you can shut down 80 of the nodes and stop paying for them. Mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Again, I don't know these product yeah. products really well, but I don't think that like Cassandra or anybody's gonna actually do that for you, but you can at least say, oh, okay, mm -hmm. I have this, I have this cushion, whatever, you know. Um, do, you, do you have any idea about sort of the scaling of that whole scatter gather process? Like if you, if you start spreading that across more and more systems, I assume that that would potentially slow things down over, over time, potentially. If you're saying I need to gather information from many, many, many different systems. I, I yeah. don't know, it, it wouldn't necessarily be linear because you're kind of just waiting for the slowest link potentially, but. I think it's complicated. So obviously if you have three partitions, five partitions, right? Scatter gather is not that scary. Um, but where I think it gets really complicated is that a lot of systems don't really let you do queries on secondary indexes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So a lot of people spend time designing their systems so that you, you don't. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, you know, like, like for Facebook, I don't know that you really are hitting secondary indexes, right? Like they want you to go to your news feed, but they don't really let you do searches. You can't really just go to Facebook and say, I want to do a search on inauguration, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the, one of the reasons why they don't have that feature is I think because it's just extremely difficult to support that in their database. Um, so this, this chapter does talk about that use case, except real world products, I don't know that they often for, mm -hmm. for like massively large products. I don't know that they actually support that. Yeah, they might just avoid it. Yeah, and then at the other extreme, if you know you're doing a big analytic thing, then you might not be using your Cassandra database. You might actually be using Spark or something else where yeah. you're not running on your production Cassandra. You're now shipping, let's say a snapshot as of last yeah. night and then you're running like some giant recommendation engine or whatever, some algorithm, you know, but it's not on like the live instantaneous production database. It's just uh, something. And so then you can obviously choose to organize it and index it and do, do things with that mm -hmm. data. Yeah. But, but it, it's always difficult to support secondary indexes. I think that's why, in my opinion, and I may be a little biased because I am a relational database guy, like that's what I know best. But I think that's one reason why they'll never go away is because secondary indexes are supported really well in relational databases. And so if you don't hit that, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Amazon type scale, where you just fundamentally cannot build a giant enough Oracle or whatever database, then, okay, maybe it's not perfect, but the good news is it just supports all these workloads mm -hmm. and it's super mature. The, the servers have really good stability and uptime. I don't worry about corruption. I don't worry about this, you know? Yeah. And so, so that's why I think, you know, you no, you're not going to support Facebook with that, but for departments within Facebook, they may actually have relational databases where they run mm -hmm. things. Um, you know, and then if you are lucky enough to have a Spark cluster, then I guess even if it requires shuffles, you um, the benefit you get from having 32 nodes in your cluster, right? From a from a response time, it can outweigh even though you're doing it inefficiently. So something that a relational database may have a clever way of doing it, even if you have to brute force it and scan through all the data, the fact that you spread it over 32 workers in parallel. Maybe, maybe no biggie. It's 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 reasonable. And so, if you're if you're fortunate enough to have that, then you can kind of 
right? You, you don't have to have the most efficient workflow if it's just, hey, here's a tool, I have Spark, I have a team, they know how to use it, even if theoretically this one query would run faster on a relational database. Yeah, we'll just get it done. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other comments or questions? All right, so just to kind of wrap up, um, so I thought that this chapter was in some ways um, one of our lighter chapters. It doesn't have that many um, heavy problems that it introduced, but at the same time, it's sort of like, and this question will be answered in chapters eight and nine. And this thing we'll discuss more, you know, how to do analytic workloads and parallel execution. We'll talk about in chapter 10 um, in the batch processing. So uh, it, in, in some ways it's sort of like, if you write a book, you have to divide it into chapters. And so this chapter just happens to be sort of like introducing certain things which get talked about more later. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, I don't know, Ryan. Um, uh, scheduled the, um, the the project thing for for one thirty. So we actually have a few minutes. We could just chat. We could. I was talking about actually, just for fun, looking at that that geo thing. Um, yeah, I transition so, early. <laughs> I I ran into this problem that that site only lets you play one game per day for free, and mm -hmm. so I could pay for it, but I don't know, not really. Or you it. could send me the link, and or, I, I don't could. know. Do I have to sign up? I have to like create an account. Or? I think you have to create an account. Oh, okay. Yeah. But all right, probably not worth the hassle. Just filling everyone else in. I I was mentioning this game earlier called GeoGuessr, where you get plopped random places in the world on Google Maps, and then you have to just look around and you have to figure out where you are just by looking at the landmarks and the buildings and the people and all of that stuff. And they, they blur out the obvious stuff. Like you can just look at license plates and stuff like that. But you um, just have to locate yourself just by your surroundings. And it's a pretty interesting game. And I figured since we have a somewhat international group here, it might be interesting to see. What's the name again? GeoGuessr. I can put a link in here. <laughs> sure. Great. Wasn't there a competition somewhere in Chicago that was supposed to do some kind of was it landmark detection or, I don't know, related to this that you're showing some other pictures and you're supposed to find out where in the world you are? Yeah, yeah. I think that one's kind of limited to more famous things, but it, it's definitely related. This one, it, it plops you a random spot and then you just kind of click around and you're trying to walk around until you find the spot. I, I'm curious how well I can do within the United States, but I don't think I would do very well around the world. It's it's actually kind of surprising because typically you can wander around and you can find a flag or something like that, or you can look at a restaurant or something and they'll say like such and such restaurant dot be, and then you know that it's it's um, from. Belarus or Belgium or something. Okay. Uh, so it, it's, and it's, it's, it's one thing to like end up in the right country. It's another thing to be like, this is this specific street that I'm on. And some people are good enough that they're able to locate and navigate very accurately like that. That's cool. 
I think if 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 it plopped me someplace that doesn't use um, an alphabet, then I think I'm hosed. <laughs> The, the real difficult ones are the ones where it puts you on a random dirt road and all you see around you is fields and then you just have absolutely no way of, of, of finding any discernible information other than just the crops around you. Mm. I was looking at a talk and they showed an example of um, Sinhalese, which I guess they speak in Sri Lanka. And uh, I mean, you could have a million signs that says, you know, this is the blah -de blah restaurant located at this address in this city, in the capital of Sri Lanka, and it would do me absolutely <laughs> no good. I can't remember last week, did we talk about that, um, that open AI Dolly um, model, the, the blog posting about that? I don't think we discussed it. I know it got posted, I think. Yeah, yeah, you, you posted something, I think, on our Slack, but uh, that was just really cool. So for people who haven't seen it, um, their latest thing that they've done, they of course have GPT-2, GPT-3, so they did, uh, they did clip where they used um, text captions for, for photos on the internet as a training set. And so then they, they used a GPT-2 style architecture for the text and they used a standard vision type architecture for the um, images and they used contrastive loss um, to train uh, basically these two networks, they train the text and the image to have a shared uh, internal representation between the two of them. And then they could basically say something along the lines of, um, here's a test image from ImageNet, ImageNet has a thousand classes. And so I'm going to create a thousand text strings that's like a photo of a dog, a photo of a cat, a photo of an avocado. And then basically, you know, the model would say, which of the, which of the, which of those it thought was the, the, the best. And so then it would say, oh, I think dog is the closest song and it guess this is a dog. So then the latest one is um, Dolly, which is a play on the Disney movie Wally -E and the artist Salvador Dolly. So then what they did is they had the image part be a generator instead of just being um, an encoder. And so now they can say uh, the one that's like, the top of their example, which is just fantastic, you know. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly what word it, the wording was, but you know, a chair that looks like an avocado. And it was pretty. I thought it was just pretty freaking amazing that it's like, oh look, here's a chair that's avocado shaped and it's green. Here's a chair that's like avocado shaped green, and the cushion is like a round, light brown cushion right where the pit of the avocado would be, and you know, just stuff like that. Um, so they're writing up a full paper on it. It hasn't come out yet. There's just the blog post that Ryan linked. Um, and then they, they did show a few things that they said this model isn't good at, you know, it's not perfect at counting objects and things like that. And it, it asked for something weird. It asked for a pentagonal clock, only five sides. And so some of the images it created had six, you know, um, but just some of the images, you know, and, and like like the second one here, you know, a storefront that has the word open AI. It's like, wow, it's generating photorealistic things with like different fonts, different style. It could be, you know, something written on glass. It could be physical letters that have three dimensionality. And then just arbitrary things that it couldn't possibly have seen in the training set you know, what if a, you know, porcupine were a cube? So 
Um, just a lot of really cool images. Oh yeah, here's one. Uh, a collection of glasses is sitting on a table. I thought it was interesting because I read that and I immediately thought like wine glasses, water glasses. And then like there were pictures that had eyeglasses and some of them had actual eyeglasses and wine glasses mixed. It's like, oh yeah, I guess it was ambiguous. It's not surprising that it did that, but. Um, but it's pretty insane that it's generating such photorealistic stuff and and such potential variety. You know, it's not like they're all cartoony or they're all this, or, you know. So I think within a within a, a few weeks we'll have the the full paper. a lot of stuff they already did playing with this that was just really cool. Sorry, uh, hi Dad and Ryan. <laughs> haven't, haven't kind of spoken for a while. Um, hey guys, uh, <laughs> um, I just wonder, uh, I, I haven't had a chance to look at this, but it, it does sound very cool. But, but did you say that it's actually generating not really identifying the images? So I, I had mentioned this, this, this clip project. That was a very, very different way of training something to be able to classify images. Mm -hmm. So is this a dog, is this a cat or whatever. The Dolly project, uh, they, they did at, completed at roughly the same time. That's the link that, that Ryan put mm -hmm. in the chat. That's a generator. So just like GPT-2 and GPT-3 generate text, now Dolly is generating images. Gotcha. And so if you okay. click that link and you look, those are completely 100% synthetic images ah. that it generated just from a text prompt after it had been fully trained. Gotcha. And so you'll see if you like expand it that they can show you like the top hundred images it generated for a chair that looks like an avocado. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And some of them are better and some of them are worse, but it, you know, um, it's just kind of amazing. Um, and, and, and this is sort of zero shot performance. So it had all of this training on images and text but it had no warning of what you were going to ask it to do. So when they said a chair that looks like an avocado, it had no warning. There was no specific training about chairs or training about avocados or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. It said, uh, you know, a porcupine, that's a cube. It had no way of knowing that you might ask for something like that. Um, going into the details, uh, it's just like the text models, it's generative. So it's actually kind of doing things sequential. So it starts in the upper left corner and then it goes like across and then it goes back to the next row and goes across, and goes like that. And so um, they can feed it if they want a certain amount of the image starting from the upper left. So one thing they can do is they give it the top half and say, just fill out what the bottom half of this image looks like. Right. And so then this one thing they did was, uh, I think they said it was a statue of the, the Greek guy Archimedes. Mm -hmm. And they gave him a hat, but they only showed you the, the top few pixels of the hat. And then basically what they did was they asked it to do this task over and over again, but, but each time they rotated the hat like five degrees. And in doing so, it then rendered Archimedes facing five degrees, slightly different directions. And so they said they were able to composite that into a 3D, basically, rendering of Archimedes. 
I wonder what this will do to um, the whole uh, kind of um, like photography or artwork world that that's still making their money off, um, I mean, the original art and creation. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, theoretically, if you need clip art, instead of, right, finding stock photos, you could just say, hey, Dolly, give me a whatever, baseball player about to catch a ball. Yeah, yeah. And all the PowerPoint that people do that need photos, <laughs> that would, yeah. Yeah, right, like Maya said, you can say, I want a daikon and a tutu, like, <laughs> you know, doesn't have to be out there. I can't remember where I saw it. I saw something about um, artists who were using GANs to, um, create new kinds of artwork. So, so the cool thing is as soon as you have this capability, right, then an artist can add another layer that the computer can't do. And so then they can make like beautiful things where like maybe, you know, the GAN can do something or this dolly can do something, but then the artist can figure out a way to use that as like a starting point and then, you know, have that have it be a stamp or have it be mm -hmm. something and then they do an artistic interpretation beyond that you know um uh they can take like a um a computer that generates a thousand images of a chair that looks like an avocado and they can then make a mosaic as an artist of those images into like a big you know so the cool thing is that i don't think artists will ever be out of a job well, the thing is that the machine will continue to learn on top of that, right? Yeah. So like, the artist will, it will have to be, uh, will continue to be super creative uh, on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I know very little about art, but right, but at some point, painters got pretty good at making realistic portraits, right? So then the art world evolved into non-realistic things, impressionism, and then ultimately cubism and whatever, right? So, yeah, so when the computer can do, you know, a daikon and a tutu, then an artist may just then be able to do some level beyond that. And when the computer can do that, then the artist will just move on, you know? They'll, I think there'll always be a need for artists to just sort of think of what's the next level of interesting thing you can do. Yeah, but so, but to, to your original point, so the, I think the artists are safe or at least the top <laughs> artists are safe. Yeah. But, but yeah, stock photos, I don't know. I don't know that they're, they could go out of business. Cool.